Let's talk about some of these headlines with former Fox host Geraldo Rivera. He is currently News Nation's correspondent at large. Geraldo, thanks so much for being with us. Hi, Brianna. Nice to join you. Thank you very much. I first want to get your thoughts on Gates and his withdrawing from contention. Are you surprised that Trump didn't end up going to the mat politically for him? I, I am relieved, tremendously relieved. I don't know if I am particularly surprised. Uh, Matt Gates is a toxic uh, stinker of a, of a legislator. I think that he would have been a horrible choice at the Department of Justice. He's barely a lawyer. He's never prosecuted anything. Uh, you know, he has a couple of hours in his uh, in a family firm down in Florida. Uh, his, uh, you know, his sex with uh, the underage alleged uh, uh, sexual encounters with the underage uh, young lady, the 17 year old in Florida and the threesomes and then the New York Times releasing, you know, the diagrams of how he paid off uh, scores of these uh, ladies allegedly with uh, a PayPal and Venmo. Uh, it's, it's just a, a low life. I don't know, you know, uh, how the president picked him, I will never know. Seems that it was an impetuous choice. Uh, you know, there are a lot in that uh, potential cabinet, Brianna, that are very controversial, but at least they are arguably competent. Not like this guy, this guy uh, who tried uh, single handedly to destroy the House of Representatives, uh, you know, going off their, uh, uh, you know, the this, this speaker, Kevin McCarthy. It's just a. Uh, you know, uh, it, is, it is a relief, and Pan Bondi, in compared to Matt Gates, is the, the best choice you could possibly make. I mean, whatever, the relative quality of these two people is, is profound, and I wish her the best. I've known her for years, interviewed her many times. She was a regular on my at-large show on the weekends and uh, often run into her in the green room at Hannity. Uh, she's a real prosecutor, a county prosecutor. Uh, you know, with vast experience. Uh, yes, she's controversial with Trump University and a bunch of other things that I've heard you mention. Uh, you, but uh, she's the real deal. Uh, you may not like her politics, but well, that's and the, to that point, Geraldo. Well, that's a good it, it, do you question. think she's I, independent? I, that is, I think that's a fair question, and I think that we have to watch and uh, and and see. Uh, you know, I, I I'm I'm not sure. Will she be Merrick Garland? Uh, no. Uh, on the other hand, uh, she's she's tough on crime. Uh, I you know I think that she'll do an excellent job from the prosecutorial point of view. Uh, politically, uh, I I don't know if she'll go along with uh, with Trump on everything. Uh, she certainly is a, a close friend of the uh, president elect. Uh, uh, but I I hold out hope for her, and I I rely on her. You know, she was when she was reelected, Brianna. She got 55 percent of the vote. So the people of Florida have uh, have judged her and and decided uh, uh, that she was doing a good job, Brianna. So I, I do want to ask you, I mean, with Gates gone, now there's more focus on these other picks. And there are a lot of critics of Trump's defense secretary pick, Pete Hegseth, who say that he's unqualified. People like Congressman Jason Crow, Jake Auchincloss, Senator Tammy Duckworth, among many other veterans. Uh, last week, you said of your former colleague that I think it would be a very, very steep learning curve for Major Hegseth, but I think that if anyone can do it, he can do it. Uh, and you said some very positive things about him. I wonder, has your opinion changed at all since this police report from the 2017 uncharged investigation into a sexual assault allegation against him came out? Also a, a fair question. I did not know about that uh, 2017 uh, alleged sex assault. Uh, I, I think that it, it certainly merits uh, investigation and people should ponder its significance uh, in terms of uh, his uh, confirmation. Uh, but I go back to what I said uh, last week. I don't, I don't re retract that at all. I know Pete, uh, Major Pete uh, pretty well uh, over the years uh, and Fox and Friends weekend and, uh, you know, have socialized with he and his wife, Jennifer. And I, I, I think that he has to get enormous deference for the fact that he is a legitimate combat veteran, twice awarded the Bronze Star, one of the foremost advocates for veterans in our country. Uh, he's very popular among that community. Uh, can, can he run a business with three million employees? Uh, I don't know, but I do know that everybody, uh, you know, that has any uh, 
center right kind of feelings believe that the Defense Department has gone uh, too, uh, too ordinary, uh, too woke is the term uh, that, they, that they use, uh, uh, too much with DEI and, uh, uh, you know, not enough with uh, ferocity and, uh, and, and lethality and, 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 uh, and war fighting capabilities. So maybe Pete will inspire us to that uh, while keeping, uh, obviously, uh, the care, the, the, the treatment of, uh, of GIs uh, foremost in his concern. Uh, my wife Erica and I disagree with, uh, with Pete on his, uh, uh, his op opposition to women in combat. You mentioned uh, Senator Tammy Duckworth, a helicopter pilot lost both of her legs in combat. Uh, 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 Tulsi Gabbard, a colonel in, uh, with combat experience, uh, also a combat veteran. Uh, she, her, she will be his colleague. In, in the cabinet if both are confirmed. So I think, I think that Pete is wrong headed in, in uh, some of these big, uh, big issues, but I also think, I go back to what I said before, I think Major Pete is one of those guys, you know, Brianna, you just, uh, you just trust them. I, I don't like the tattoos and all that stuff, but you know, I have tattoos too. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, and it is interesting to get your perspective as someone who spent a lot of time with him. I also want to ask you about Dan Bongino, because I'm sure that you saw this. He's been floated as Secret Service director, the possibility <laughs> of, I mean, there you go. And I, I just want to be clear for our viewers who aren't familiar, you two <laughs> sparred a lot on Fox, and man, am I being understated when I say that. How would you feel about him being Secret Service director? <laughs> that, I, I can't imagine anyone who uh, I, I, feel, I feel more fiercely combative with than uh, than Dan Bongino. If he were to walk into a bar and I was having a beer, uh, you know, we, we probably square off. Uh, we disagree on everything. Uh, you know, we, you know, I, I think he has his own set of facts. Uh, I, I think he's, uh, you know, a provocateur. Uh, but I, 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 go back, uh, I go back to what I said about Major Pete. I have no issue at all with his, uh, with his honesty, his credibility, his character, his, his patriotism, his love of the Secret Service. I think all those things are positive for Bongino. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that in some ways, all of these people uh, in the cabinet, and, and you could name others as well, Dr. Oz, uh, are great on TV. Uh, they, uh, they are bigger than life. They're great communicators. I see where the president-elect is going with this cabinet. Uh, can they do the job, uh, you know, the day-to-day, -day, the administrative stuff? Uh, running these businesses, and they are giant businesses, even though they're government agencies. You know, uh, I, I guess we'll we'll see. Some will, some won't. But I, with Bongino, uh, you know, uh, I, I I would let me put it this way: if I was a, a target, and Bongino was on the job, I feel that Bongino would keep me safe. He would do the job, Brianna. That is very interesting, Geraldo. It's always great to have you, Geraldo Rivera. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Delighted. Thank you very much. Up first, Donald Trump's transition troubles. This week, his pick for attorney general withdrew from consideration, and his choice for defense secretary tried to build Senate support amid sexual assault allegations. As Republicans on Capitol Hill walk a tightrope, handling Trump's controversial nominees. That was great to have momentum for the Trump fans administration. Less than 24 hours after that show of self-confidence, Matt Gates pulling the plug on his bid to be attorney general. Mr. President, are you reconsidering the nomination of Matt Gates? No. But Trump's support for Gates ended after getting reports at least four Senate Republicans couldn't get past a House ethics investigation into claims Gates had multiple sexual encounters with a minor, which he denied. I know enough people that were a hell no. Trump quickly nominating former Florida Attorney General Pam Bondi to lead the DOJ as his transition team scrambles to secure GOP support for other cabinet hopefuls. The matter was fully investigated and I was completely cleared. Pentagon picked Pete Hegseth on the Hill with Vice President-elect J.D. Vance. Dealing with a police report, a woman accused him of sexual assault in 2017. He's going to have to answer those questions with regard to anything that's in his record. Hegseth is not alone. 
Some Republicans also non-committal about Health and Human Services nominee Robert Kennedy Jr. We got a process. He's got to go through the process. And Tulsi Gabbard shot to lead national intelligence also in question after supporting Syria's dictator and blaming NATO for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This is not a place for a Russian, Iranian, Syrian, Chinese sympathizer. Here with me today, New York Times journalist and the interview podcast host, Lulu Garcia Navarro. Raihan Salam, president of the Manhattan Institute and National Review contributing editor. Politics and policy contributor at Bloomberg, Nia Malika Henderson. And conservative pollster and New York Times opinion writer, Kristen Soldis Anderson. Welcome back, everyone. Kristen, let's start with the Gates rejection by Senate Republicans. How big a setback for Donald Trump? I think I mentioned on the show last week that this was Donald Trump was a raptor testing the fences. He has discovered that they are electrified, that there are some places that Senate Republicans simply will not go. I think that Gates was always going to be the hardest sell. I am not surprised to see him have to withdraw. I do think that the Republican senators want to get to yes on everybody else, and I think that includes Pete Hegseth. We'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But I do want to talk about the message here. Trump was riding high after the election, picking cabinet nominees at a record pace, telling the Senate to go on recess and give his choices a pass. But now Gates appears to be the earliest failed cabinet pick in modern history. Nia, how big a reality check for Donald Trump? Well, listen, I think Donald Trump thought he was going to be able to muscle Matt Gates through. If you think about it, uh, this is his second defeat in the face of this uh, Republican Senate. He really wanted Rick Scott to be uh, the majority leader. They picked John Thune. So now with, with Matt Gates, they've sort of said no, thank you to Donald Trump. He was threatening a lot of these folks uh, with primary challenges that were going to be backed by Elon Musk, uh, and they still turned uh, turned their backs on what, what Matt Gates uh, w- was going to be. And, 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 and I think he sort of has misread or overread the mandate, overread his ability to power through this uh, Republican Congress and this I, Senate. I, I, I want to pick up Senate. on that, Raihan, with you, because I, I think there was this sense, Trump certainly never said it explicitly, but there was this sense that he was just going to come into town and sweep away a lot of the traditional guardrails, like the Senate, like some of the other constraints on a president. And in this very first test, the guardrails held. Well, I have to say there's some reporting which suggests that this choice of Gates happened pretty improvisationally, shall we say, while they were all gathered together on the plane and Susie Wiles was back in the back of the plane, not hearing about it, right? His chief of staff, his designated chief of staff. Uh, And similarly, uh, you know, in uh, a conversation with uh, Maggie Haberman, an inside source in Trump world seemed to suggest that were Gates to go away, it would be all right and you'd go back to the drawing board. Some of us already believed that some of this is improvisational. Some of this is testing the guardrails, number one. Number two, some of us also believed that the genius of the framers is that, guess what? Senators are elected to six-year terms. Senators are jealously protective of their institution and their prerogatives. And so the idea that he was going to somehow get all of these Republican senators, all these senators, period, to subordinate themselves to him, it was always a bit of a fanciful sense. I I think that this was very, very predictable. Lulu? I mean, what I think is this. Everyone's sort of touting that the guardrails held. It was four senators who were the guardrails in this particular case um, that didn't give uh, Matt Gates the vote. That's a very, very small group of people. We don't know what the number is because it wasn't a vote. It wasn't a vote, but we knew. There were at least 30 who raised concerns, right, in reporting. But, I mean, regardless, the point is he was trying to steamroll the Senate. And the Senate said no. Yeah, but he was trying to steamroll the Senate with an absolutely unfit. That was the point. And, no, no, but and and more reporting came out throughout this process that really put him in a difficult position. Uh, I have to say, had there not been more evidence that that he had had contact with that 17-year-old that he was grooming high school students, um, I think it would have been a different story. At the end of the day, look what happened in the House. They actually still haven't released uh, that report on him. They were trying to protect him. And so, I don't know, I don't see this as some sort of, like, celebration of, of the system working. Lulu, as we said in, in the setup piece, uh, some of Trump's other picks, that we named also face headwinds. Do you think that other nominees will be rejected or 
you know, just to do it delicately, pull themselves out? And if so, who do you think is in the most jeopardy? I think Tulsi Gabbard is probably going to be in the most jeopardy. She's the choice for director of national intelligence. She's the choice for director of national intelligence. And I think the process isn't just, we haven't even gotten to the place where they're actually on the Hill yet and testifying. What's happening now is the media is digging into all these people. And what's happening now is that people are really, you know, focusing on them. And so I actually think the more that's going to come out, the harder that it's going to be for some of these people. But again, I've been on the record as saying from the beginning that I thought, you know, they're all going to get through. So, you know, <laughs> this don't is take my word for well, it. Let me ask you, know, you, Ryan, do you think <laughs> other Trump nominees will go down? I think it's entirely possible that it will happen. My guess, as Kristen was saying, is that Republican senators are going to, generally speaking, want his nominees to get through. But, you know, think back to uh, Bill Clinton, when he was trying to, he was very important to him to have a female attorney general, the first female attorney general. He went through Zoe Baird, then Kimba Wood, then finally Janet Reno, someone that he did not know at all. These things happen. What's happening now is that the cycle is much faster. The media frenzy is much more. And when Donald Trump does something, he's doing things that other presidents have done, but it's more lurid, it's more crazy, it's more I, I, mean, I don't only would push back to the extent to say, that it is not unusual for presidents to lose some picks. George H.W. Yep. Bush lost John Tower. Absolutely. The difference is that Trump seemed to think after his reelection that he was going to come into town and remake the rules, and he didn't. One other thing that people have noticed about Trump's picks, how many come from television? Pete Hegseth, Dr. Oz, Tulsi Gabbard, Sean Duffy, Mike Huckabee. Kristen, what do Trump's picks, these ones in particular, say about his priorities? Well, people are always looking for someone who they are comfortable with, and Donald Trump is very comfortable with people he has seen on television. He also prioritizes showmanship. He prioritizes messaging. And I think he thinks by choosing people who he enjoys watching on television, that that will put a good face on his administration. And that on the policy stuff, that can all get sorted out by him just saying, no, I want this, get it done. And as long as somebody is a good face on television, it will make his agenda work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's, he's very big on charisma. He's very big on uh, looking the part. Whether or not that plays, with these Republican senators uh, who were appointed to six-year terms. They're, they have been there before Donald Trump. They're going to be there long after Donald Trump. So I think some of these folks, you mentioned Tulsi Gabbard, uh, I think somebody like Pete Hegseth uh, also might have an issue because what Trump likes uh, isn't necessarily fitting with some of the qualifications that these senators are looking for. And it's not enough for them to be able to say, well, Donald Trump won the election, he's got uh, all chambers, uh, and we're just going to rumber stamp his piece. His, but, but his Lulu, I'm asking a, a somewhat different question, which is, what does do these TV hosts, and, and look, some of them were, uh, Huckabee was the governor of Arkansas, but, but what does his attraction to these TV hosts say about Trump? What, they, what it says is that he is interested in how this plays to the general public. He wants to dominate the media narrative. He is fascinated by television. He wants um, these people to go out and be his spokesperson. And really, he thinks that that is why he won the election, that he was able to kind of dominate the new media game, that he was really able to penetrate parts of the country that were not penetrated before. And I think that um, he believes that these people are going to be able to do that. And again, he's planning on radically remaking government. And so he's going to need spokespeople to sell that to the American people. So maybe he's right in choosing these people. Uh, any sense of so what think, you would have need to have done to get on the list? I think based on the reporting that I'm hearing is that there was a collection of information that is gathered. I think my sense is that this would go to the types of places that she was traveling right. to. So what I think this does is it opens a line of communication for the Senate as they're conducting the confirmation hearing to ask where are these places that she's been going as a private citizen, as, as this reporting pertains right. to uh, her being on the list, as I understand it, earlier this year? What types of places was she going? Um, countries, uh, what types of contacts? Was it foreign leaders? Um, you know, was it in countries that are of national security mm -hmm. concern? That's what I would take from this, yeah. is that the particular places she was traveling were of national security concern. So I do think that this was an algorithm issue mm -hmm. where the combination of the places <clears throat> she was going um, perhaps the nature of the people that she was meeting with then triggered this particular right. 
um, alert for her, which then just provides a secondary mechanism for TSA and for the Department of Homeland Security to make sure okay. that the people um, who are getting on planes are doing so safely. Andy, I think we have your voice back, all importantly. I, I don't want to place too much faith. I think we've learned a lot of lessons about uh, placing too much faith in any particular algorithm, but these algorithms are built, they're designed to protect the country's national security and to keep track of things that, that perhaps you might not notice otherwise. Can you give a sense of why someone like her would end up on a list like this? Sure. So th there's a couple of things to, to really point out here. This is a program that was designed to help screeners and security folks like TSA air marshals be aware of individuals who might present a risk, but who are not people who are currently watch listed, right? The terrorism screening database is the nation's watch list of terror subjects or people who are suspected of involvement in terrorism. One of the quote unquote rules that this system uses to identify people is to first make sure that the person they're thinking about is actually not watch listed. So if you were watch listed, you would never be included in this secure flight program. This is designed to find people who are not known by the government, are not thought of as being terrorists, but for whatever reason, the places they traveled, the people they contacted while they were there, have raised in some minimal way uh, a level of concern and one that could be addressed by additional screening before you get on the plane. So you might have to go through the magnetometer twice or speak to the TSA person for some longer period than you normally would. And it is designed to do, Jim, exactly what we've been told since 9-11, which is connect the dots, right? Yeah. Find those people who we're not even aware of and subject them to some level of scrutiny so we can make sure that we've resolved potential threats. Listen, I, as I was reading this story, I, I personally run into this. I, I remember when I had a lot of stamps in my passport from, from countries like Iraq and Afghanistan, I got an extra layer, just a few more questions when I was going through, for instance, airport security uh, via London. Uh, Maggie, I wonder, uh, we've seen the president back away from Matt Gates when it became clear to him he didn't have the votes uh, in the Senate, and by the way, with uh, you know, quite al alarming accusations about his personal behavior here, questions about Tulsi Gabbard go beyond this watch list. Let's be frank. I've spoken to people uh, in the intelligence community who have hard questions about the fact that she has parroted Russian propaganda on issues of national security uh, to this country. Do you believe the president sticks by her regardless? Look, I, I think, number one, he's not the president yet. I, it's sort of remarkable to me as we were talking about these uh, the, these nominee rollouts. He can't nominate anybody yet. He's not in office yet, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, I do think he feels differently about Tulsi Gabbard than he did about Matt Gates. I think Matt Gates was done. Uh, it, Matt Gates's name had come up before that plane ride where Trump made up his mind to do this or, you know, leaned into doing it to announcing Gates. And then he pulled back. But he, it, it, he was sticking with him, but he was pretty clear with people. Gates had a high bar. Uh, Gabbard has flown uh, under the radar more because of all the attention on Matt Gates. She is right. obviously getting more attention now. Trump is somebody who has also said things uh, that are more in line with how Vladimir Putin looks at the world uh, than U.S. leaders typically do. So I don't think that's going to be something that would make him back off. He really likes her. Uh, he, she joined him in debate prep. Uh, he, has, he has grown very fond of her. A lot of people around him have grown very fond of her. I think it would take a lot for him to back mm -hmm. off of her, frankly. We'll see what happens as we get closer to the potential for hearings. Yeah, to, to your point, listen, uh, one thing Tulsi Gabbard did is around the time of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, she tweeted placing blame for that invasion on the Biden administration and, and on NATO, which, by the way, is, is not too far off with J.D. Vance, uh, the vice president-elect, has said uh, about the war in Ukraine. V Van, I, I wonder um, what you think the political fallout is here, because there certainly is an appetite uh, for change in Washington. We saw that in the results of this election. And, and, and President Trump is, seems to be serving that with some of these appointments. But let, let's be frank, in potential Senate confirmation hearings, when on national television, Tulsi Gabbard is asked about comments that she has made, uh, American people will hear that. I mean, does, that, does he maintain that political support for someone like her? Well, look, um, I, I know Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, I consider her to be a friend. I knew her before she was in Congress. Uh, I know her, her dad, who was a, a great lawmaker in Hawaii, a, a pro-environment. 
um, uh, she has a, a big opportunity and a responsibility here to clear up all this stuff. There's a big cloud over her. Um, I don't care about this algorithm because, as, as you said yourself, al algorithms are, are just trip wires. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not any kind of uh, a definitive proof of anything. But it does create an opportunity for Tulsi Gabbard to get in front of the American people and explain all this stuff. People don't yet understand why she says the stuff she says, why she does the stuff she does. And uh, I, I, if she would just use this moment, uh, maybe she can clear some of this stuff up. Uh, she's going to have one of the most important jobs on planet Earth uh, because you know, U.S. intelligence is key to Western security. It's key to global security. And so uh, I don't care about this algorithm. I do care about the cloud over her, and I hope she takes this opportunity to clear some of this stuff up. Joe, I, I wonder what your perspective is, because I've spoken to Republican, sitting Republican lawmakers who have concerns about Tulsi Gabbard, not because of this watch list, the couple of months she spent on that, but because of the views, views that contradict U.S. assessment, bipartisan assessments as to who America's true adversaries and threats are, Russia, China, uh, Syria, et cetera. They have concerns, and you can understand those concerns, right? Because, I mean, it used to be bipartisan that folks look at Russia as a, as a, uh, as a threat to this country or, or the Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad. In your view, should she be the director of national intelligence? Well, uh, again, first and foremost, President Trump has the right, as the president-elect, to nominate individuals that he believes will further his foreign policy vision. Uh, I do think that we, we can't have it both ways. We're having a conversation about algorithmic tripwires that have foiled many people that never rise to the level of being in charge of the intelligence for the national intelligence for the United States of America. And so if we understand that, yes, Oftentimes, brown people, black people get caught up in this nonsense, then maybe perhaps we should not be having a national conversation about the fact that she got caught up in this mix. I do think, to your further point, is she the right person for the job? I think that just because you might actually have agreements with Russia does not necessarily mean that you are a foil for Russia. At the end of the day, there are critical arguments to be made about the fact that the president of Ukraine and many people in the United States Senate wanted us to have preemptive sanctions that might have deterred Vladimir Putin from driving those tanks across the border into Ukraine. And there were people in this country on the political left that prevented us from having those preemptive sanctions. And so, yes, there was a robust conversation about foreign policy that can have. I agree with Van. She has the opportunity now to have that critical conversation with the nation mm -hmm. and with the senators. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I think trying to act as if somehow she is not fit for the job is in many ways inconsistent with individuals that have held this post before and other presidents that have been given the purview to nominate who they choose for roles when they not, might not necessarily have the prototypical profile for a particular yeah. position. Well, DNIs have typically had quite an extensive uh, experience at the top levels of the U.S. levels of the U.S. intelligence community.